<clears throat> I actually came to uh, Woods Hole as a young child uh, because my father was um, involved in the Grass Foundation in the early years. And so he'd bring me along and they'd have functions and that was always fun as a young, young child. Uh, and then uh, when I went into uh, academics, when I went to graduate school, my advisor at UMass Amherst, John Roberts, uh, used to come here and work in the aquarium. And he, uh, he would study these very interesting fish that um, breathe by holding their mouth open and swimming. And, they, and so instead of pumping their water using their, the gill muscles, they just open their mouth and swim. It's a pretty cool way to do it. And it's called ramjet ventilation. And, and so he studied that, and I don't know why, I came down with him, and that it was in 1973. And from the time I walked, got out of the car, and went into the aquarium, I knew I had to come back here. And so in graduate school, I asked him if I could come back here and take a course. So in 1974, I took the neurobiology course. Um, with, uh, and I was very naive, and uh, I, uh, I'm a slow, I, I, my development academically was very slow and then shot off, uh, and, and I think coming here was very, you know, a very influential moment in my life as to being so immature academically and then seeing all these people around me and then trying to quickly rise to the occasion. Uh, that course changed my life, as I'm sure many people have told you about courses. The faculty uh, included Rudolf Alinas, Mike Bennett, John Dowling, um, Herb Levitan, uh, George Pappas, and the biochemist escapes me. I apologize. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll figure that out later or we can look it up. But those individuals um, you know, ran the course at the time, the neurobiology course. And it had a you know, strong impact on me. So after I took that course, uh, I did, I, since then I've done everything I can possibly do to come here for whatever period of time I can afford to come here. And I could give you a list of all of those things if you want, but uh, it's worked out. I've, I've more or less I've come probably f since 1978, almost every year. As the course is today, it, it's very intense. It was a little bit longer then, I think. I think it's eight weeks now. It was uh, probably closer to nine weeks then. And you would get up in the morning and start lecture around nine o'clock and um, have a break for lunch. And then you'd come start in the lab after lunch. And you might take a break for dinner, but you, did, you stayed in that lab until the wee hours You'd stay till midnight, typically, sometimes later. Um, and by the time you had gotten about five weeks into the course, you were pretty beat. Uh, not much sleep and tons of information. So surviving, surviving the course was interesting. I give you one story that uh, later on in the course, we, uh, I got home, I think, you know, probably two in the morning. and and I was just exhausted and I just collapsed and went right to sleep. And then a uh, short time later, my wife tells me that I sat bolt upright in the bed and screamed out, the ganglion, we've got to perfuse the ganglion. <laughs> and she thought that was it. She had the straight jacket ready. <laughs> Another story I can tell you that sticks out very clearly in my memory was uh, we were with Rudolfo, we were doing um, the squid the classic squid preparation, which has a, a presynaptic, large presynaptic ending on a very large postsynaptic target, the giant axon of the squid. And it's a classic preparation. The, the dissection takes a little time to learn, and we did that fairly quickly. And, and then he would kind of give us ideas of things we could do, and we read papers. And in any case, this one night, uh, after dinner, we were in there. Well, all afternoon, we were trying to get a preparation to work well, and it just wouldn't work well. 
preparation after preparation, electrode after electrode, trying to go in and it just wasn't working. So about midnight I'd had it. I was exhausted. We tried many preps and so I got up and I said I have to go home and uh, my partner said yeah that's a good idea and I got up and I started to walk. I walked walking out of the lab and I got to the doorway and who appears but Rodolfo at midnight and he goes you're going to do another <laughs> as a student I said of course <laughs> I turned around and that preparation worked so beautifully that uh, he came over and he called everybody over it was just luck it wasn't me you know it was just luck he called everybody over and started to do experiment after experiment and telling us and helping us and getting us to suggest. So I've done the Mouthner cell, even to this day I do it, and, but I, I thought it would be uh, really interesting to study it, and particularly because fish uh, uh, have the ability to regenerate, functionally regenerate the nervous system. So I had, in graduate school, I read an article that if you cut the spinal cord of a fish, they recover. And I didn't believe it. I said, that can't be because they're vertebrates, we're vertebrates, we can't do it, how can they do it? And so I actually on the side did a little experiment and it turned out they did. So I was, I was I've, I've sort of chased that where I study um, and, and just think about it, you, you damage the, the axons of these cells, they, they can no longer initiate the response they did before. You, you give them time, the fish to recover, and then you can directly investigate whether they've reconnected. And uh, they don't. So that was a bummer, I thought they would. They don't, they, they, they regrow, but they s don't seem to be able to find their targets. Yet the startle response returns. That interesting. So at first I was really bummed out, but then I realized, well, this is kind of neat. In the same brain, you have cells that are in, seem to be incapable of reconnecting appropriately to initiate the function, whereas you have other cells that can. So if you can tap into those differences, maybe you can learn the secret. So it turns out that Jen Morgan and I have talked a lot. Jen, who you've also interviewed, is doing very similar sorts of things in, a, in lamprey, uh, where there are good regenerating cells that are called good regenerators that apparently can find their targets, and cells that are poor regenerators that apparently can't. And guess which one in the lamprey is a poor regenerator? The Bovner cell, right? So it seems consistent across phy uh, phylogenies that uh, the cell somehow um, is somewhat fundamentally different from other cells. Uh, the odd thing to me is it grows all over the place. It's not as if it can't regrow, but it normally regrows um, down the spinal cord towards the tail. But when you damage it, it grows in both directions, in the wrong direction up towards the nose and in the proper direction. It has a little trouble getting across the wound and then it, it can select pathways it didn't select before. And I think that's why it can't find its targets. It actually goes out ventral roots out towards the periphery. It never does that normally. It just is looking and can't in the adult. And it, it's looking, but it seem, can't seem to find its uh, home base. The changes that I, I have seen um, are the people that are no longer here is one thing that I sort of grew up with here uh, that defined, at the time, defined uh, the research. These individuals were involved in uh, various areas, not just uh, neurobiology, which is my specialty. So one that comes to mind is Lad Prosser, who uh, was uh, one of the most outstanding comparative physiologists um, in, in the United States. And he wrote a comparative physiology book that I don't think has ever been continued or re rewritten. And he uh, 
he had an, they, all these individuals had an influence on me in one way or another. Um, and uh, Clay Armstrong, who still comes to the MBL but not to do science. And John Moore, who still comes to the MBL but is no longer doing science. Those individuals uh, sort of were my role models. And um, so the change is they're no longer here, right? It's uh, a natural passing, uh, moving on of science. Um, so that's one change that you have to sort of deal with. New people come along. And I've been fortunate since I've been with the Grass Foundation since 1987. When I, well, 1978 as a Grass Fellow, 1987 as, uh, as a trustee, and I've remained a trustee, and I'm a life trustee now. I've had the, the pleasure and, of uh, being able to meet uh, scientists that come through as Forbes lecturers, um, which the foundation supports, and trustees of the Grass Foundation, many of whom are MBL people. Uh, so anyway, that's one change. The, the courses haven't changed a great deal, which is in, in, in some ways, um, in, in the sense of their intensity, in the commitment of the faculty remains the same. But of course, the subject matter has changed in exciting ways to keep up with the technology and new techno and techniques. And if you want to get the flavor for this, I recommend that you go over there at night, you know, go over at nine at night and see what's going on. The students are just, you know, doing projects and learning things. So, so the courses have changed, but the um, commitment of individuals continues. And actually that's true, uh, you know, I say that, that the personnel has changed, but the, even with the summer research and the year-round research, you talk to Jen Morgan, you get to see the excitement and the commitment. There's something about this place that uh, continues that. Um, administrations have changed, and now we have a new phase of affiliation with the University of Chicago. Um, but the MBL still remains the MBL, the spirit is still here. I think one reason, you know, another reason I love to come back here and connect with people uh, is that the people have a, have a history. They've been, they were the base. I got to meet Harry Grunfest. I, got, I, got to, uh, I know Rudolfo and Mike Bennett and John Dowling. I know these people. Those to me are historic moments because they're, uh, they're, they're the base. I consider them for me. I mean, of course, other people might have had a, a base at an earlier time or a base at a later time, but that's history, living history. And then once you have that living, living history base, uh, they all had mentors. So Mike Bennett was trained by Harry Grunfest, so I want to know more about Harry Grunfest. So who do I go to? But Mike, he's got another base platform, and Harry Grunfest had other, I don't know in his history entirely, but he had. So, so in that sense, um, historical events are continual, it's living history now, and living history leads to past history, and so those, it's, for me, it's sparks all the time. Um, you know, I've been here during Hurricane Bob, and, and seen boats lifted out of the water and laid on the grass, and uh, huge granite blocks lifted and laid on the road, with no damage other than the block got lifted and replaced, and the power of the ocean, the fact that this place is where it is, um, is a historical moment, you know, going back. Uh, and again, if you read the Lily, ver you know, Lily edition of the Biological Bulletin, you get a sense of this better than I can, can portray it. But um, the uh, Smithsonian, um, and uh, who's the individual, Matt, um, whose name is escaping me briefly, who's, who came here and set up the fisheries lab. Baird. Yeah, Spencerton Baird, thank you. Spencerton Baird uh, was commissioned by the um, uh, Smithsonian to find a, a spot to put a marine lab. And so he spent a lot of time going up and down the East Coast looking. And, and uh, he came here, and I think in part because the Gulf Stream pushes warm water in here, the diversity of Flora and fauna just blew him away, and he uh, he he was in, you know influential in this area being developed to what it is today, uh, with the first lab 
National Fisheries Lab in Little Harbor where the Coast Guard station is and, and then subsequently where it is now in various, um, in various forms. Uh, and, and so that, um, you know, that's the sort of history that I feed off of and it's the history that's it's here so I'm always looking at plaques and there's a plaque for Spencerton Baird right out here. There's a plaque over by the Yacht Club about Gosnold's um, visit here, voyage here, supposedly, and, and on and on and on and on and on. But they, they're, it's, um, those are all historic moments that um, have taken place and I've been connected to in various ways. Um, it's spiritual. It's, it's hard to answer that in defined terms. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons you come back. It's the people you meet. You want to meet them again. You want to be around them. It's the, uh, the intensity because many times at your home institution you don't have that intensity. You, you know, at Williams, is, in my case, is a small college and I teach during the school year and I do research but it's at a much lower energy level. So I come back to get a shot of adrenaline. And it's, to me, it's adrenaline, adrenaline. Lectures and people to talk with who will listen to you. And all of that is part of it. But I think beyond that, it, it is spiritual and it's hard to define. It's sort of the history of the people that were here. Uh, I mean, Louis Agassiz was in Penikes and, you know, Alpheus Hyatt at Anasquam, and I never met them, but I read about them, and the Women's Education Society, and small colleges, and, and um, the directors, and the, the way this place ran from, as a summer place, exclusively, and everybody would come and bring their equipment, and their animals, and students, and a place for everybody to come where everybody was welcome to do research everybody. Whereas at their home institution they might not have that feeling. They might feel that, uh, that there was a certain, um, at that time a male dominated old boys club uh, sort of environment. It's not that that might not exist in small pockets here, but it, it was different. It was, you know, you were here for the summer. Um, people, I think, had a different feeling about participation and and joining in in this organization. And you get that from the history. So um, that's part of the spiritual aspect. You, you come here and you feel it. 